Hello and welcome to Life in Focus with me, your host, Stephen Akinsanya. On this week's show, sadly, you have to return to a topic which I've discussed before in recent years. And um, we look at the figures of the amount of uh, street violence ending in fatalities, not just in our capital in London, but across the nation, the length and breadth of the country, whether it's Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, uh, Newcastle, the figures are going up. We are well aware of the figures in previous years and in 2022, it appears to be heading in the same direction. And I want to explore on this week's show with my guests, why the escalation in street violence with an economy that is under strain, with inflation soaring through the roof, with the most uh, in need, those in poverty likely to be hit the most. What does that spell in terms of the future for our young people, particularly who are involved in street violence? Why is it happening? Why are the initiatives seemingly not working? And how do we fix it? These are just some of the questions that I hope to address with my guests. Now, I'm not interested in the provocative arguments that people will say, well, knife crime is a black problem. It's nothing to do with any other community. Well, that can't be right. You look up and down this country, young people particularly are being stabbed from all races. And so I don't want to hear people just say it's nothing to do with a particular section of the society. Society as a whole is in a whole heap of trouble as far as I'm concerned. There is a sense of lawlessness going on and we don't understand fully how to deal with it. And it's potentially set to get worse. Just this week at Carnival, sadly, a young man lost his life at the end of Carnival. There were 33 arrests for possession of offensive weapons, 441 stop and searches, six other stabbings apart from the fatality. So why is this happening? Joining me this week are guests who've been on the show before, and I'm glad to have them back, experts in their field, and hopefully able to cast some light on the questions that I've posed. I'm going to be joined by uh, Nana Aguman, a social entrepreneur and managing director of Access UK. I'm also going to be joined by Anthony Peltier, who is an assistant chief officer with the Met Police. And also, hopefully my final guest, Sheldon Thomas, chief executive of Gangs Line Trust. So um, before we uh, embark on the conversation, I'm going to ask that my guests keep their um, mics on mute until they contribute, just to avoid the background um, interference. But look, I want to welcome you both back to Life in Focus, gentlemen, as we, we're here again, sadly. Um, and I, I, I want to try and understand, really, uh, how we got here. But before, before we answer that question, I want to come to you, Nana, uh, because it's something that I saw recently that you... Um, produced and put out there uh, in, in answer to this myth, if you like, that knife crime is a black problem. Um, so let's let's just deal with that now. What is the true picture, Nana, of knife crime in this country today? Well, I, I think that whole perception is not by accident. It's, it's, it's by design. Um, just to clarify, it's by design. Yeah. And I think it's designed to divide people rather than bring people together, you know, to make this, you know, we only account for three to five million of the population of a population of about 70 million people. So you can't tell me that black people from that population are committing all the crimes up and down the country, um, you know, in terms of knife crime and serious violence, as we've seen in Liverpool and other parts of the country, it's affecting all communities. But uh, the media has obviously got a very important role in perpetuating this myth of black criminality. Um, it's affecting every. It's affecting all communities. There was I don't know if you. I don't know if you you were aware. There was um, I always forget her name. She's a She's a one of the presenters on ITV Good Morning Britain. 
I can't remember the lady's name, but there was, a, there was a particular, a few years back, there was a time where a young person was killed near where she lived in Clapham Common, I, I believe. And you saw her reaction on TV on, on Good Morning Britain. And she was nearly breaking down into tears because it brought home to her that actually this can, this can happen right on my doorstep. My children can be impacted by knife crime. It's not some you know faraway place or some quote unquote black area, um, you know where I don't need to care about. Actually, it's right on my doorstep, mm -hmm. and that kind of realization was very, very. It was a very, very powerful image to reinforce the fact that it's affecting everybody. Mm -hmm. um, statistically, Glasgow, up until recently, was the knife crime capital of Europe, not just in Britain, of Europe, and there's not a lot of people that look like me and you. Uh, that live in Glasgow or Scotland. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we need to challenge. Obviously, in London, there's a higher, quote-unquote, BAME population. And that's mm -hmm. obviously, that's reflected in, t in terms of the victims of knife crime and perpetu you know, people who perpetuate knife crime as a youth, mm -hmm. statistically. But if you look across a bigger picture, because London is not the sum total of the UK, if you look at a bigger picture across the board, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um you know, it's, it's become mainstream, as it were, and impacting in all youths. Yeah, thanks, Nana. Anthony, do, do you share that opinion? I mean, when we talk about um, across the country, not just London, we could focus on London, but is it a misnomer just to say, well, you know, knife crime is a, a black problem? Um, yes, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly, no, no, it's not a black problem. And I can tell you that not just from both the, the jobs I do, you know, I'm, I'm a head teacher by trade and I'm a senior police officer also. Uh, and unfortunately, I've I've had the, the sad occasion where I've held two victims of knife crime uh, in my arms. And, and unfortunately, one did pass away and, and the other one I managed to save his life. One was black and one was white. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, and, and this is going back to 2002, uh, the first victim, and it was 2012, the second victim. So, you know, youth violence, uh, violence is, is not a colour problem. It's a problem, problem. Uh, and and we, we need to grasp the concept that we are losing young people on the streets. And it's irrelevant what colour their skin is. It's a young life that has been taken by predominantly another young life. So we, we in, in direct, we lose, we're losing two young people, one to the system, uh, and, and one to, unfortunately, uh, to the ground. So you know, we need to manage this collectively. And hopefully after today, the conversation that we'll have today, um, the four of us, yeah. will hopefully bring forward some, um, not just initiatives, but some clear ways forward that we can start to um, spread how we're going to be part of this change. Thanks, Anthony. Right, well, uh, we're joined by Sheldon Thomas. I'm gr glad to see you joined us, Sheldon. Anthony, if I could just ask you to go on mute. Sheldon, I posed the question before we get into this debate about the why this is happening and how we fix it. I just wanted to qu quash immediately this suggestion that knife crime is a black problem. I wanted to get your perspective on it, Sheldon. Well, obviously, knife crime isn't a black problem because a majority of the gangs outside of London are white kids. So we know that. But we, we need to not be scared to talk about London. London has a specific problem with black kids. The gangs that exist in, in London are about 79, maybe 79% black, and the rest are made up of Asians, um, Albanians and that kind and, and and Lithuanians. The white kids in London that are involved in gangs are not gangs that operate outside of the black gangs. The, the white kids are in the black gangs. So we need to be very careful and not be afraid to speak the truth about London. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going to talk about knife crime across the UK, obviously everyone knows that literally 90% of the gangs are white. So, but we're not talking about outside of London. We're being specific to what's going on in London. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid. I know there's many people in our communities who are afraid of speaking the truth about London. I'm not, because I work in, in with all the gangs in all the prisons in London. 
and mm. they're chock-a-block filled with young black kids. We know that um, racism plays a part in the imprisonment of black kids. We're not suggesting it doesn't, it does. But we can't get away from the percentage of mm. when NHS counts the numbers, 60% of, of the young men that come into the NHS for medical attention are black kids. Mm. And the perpetrators who come into the hospitals to chase them down, because remember, when these gang members get stabbed and they, they, not, they don't die, the gangs go into the hospital to try and search and find them. So when you look at the percentage, we cannot hide from that. Now, some people will say, but there's a lot of Asian gangs. There are in Birmingham, in Bedford, in Bradford, there are lots of Asian gangs, but their percentage is very small in comparison to the black gangs but we are being pacific to london and london only we're not suggesting that the whole of uk is riddled with young black men stabbing each other that's a most absurd um scenario so what we are talking about is london and we can't be afraid to talk about london remember when i was in a gang in the 70s and 80s it was all black kids and they were from african caribbean society um, caribbean communities now, I would say 40%, maybe 50% of the gangs in London are Africans. Um, and it's different now. It's not just Caribbean kids. So um, there's nothing to be afraid of. That, that, that's the reason why we're not able to tackle it, because we've got many in our communities who don't want to talk about what is happening with. Because when you talk about black kids, then you open up other door, other situations that we don't want to talk about like absent fathers um the amount of black boys and black men that are unemployed the school exclusions that um the percentage in london uh, and across the uk is they're five times six times more likely to be excluded from school because that's the reason why we don't talk about pacific black problems in london because it opens up doors for other um, conversations which we don't want to have well, I, I want to have a conversation this evening with all of you, and I want it to be a real conversation. And apart from the issue of crime generally on our streets across the country with young people, um, I want to, obviously, we can talk about London. We all live in London. But I want to understand this mindset of youth violence that is sweeping the country. Let's deal with that first. What is fueling the kind of youth violence particularly that we're seeing on our streets across the country who wants to have a go at that well there's there's many reasons sorry to jump in i know you're about to say something Cantony, but i'll be very brief as i as i can um the reality is this we've got a a, a culture of social media that promotes this kind of i don't care attitude when i go into the prisons um, I go into Felton, Brixton Prison, Rochester, um, Belmarsh, and I speak to not just black kids, I speak to all kids. Um, but when you speak to certain age groups, so I'm talking about 13 going to 18, there is this attitude is, I don't really care. I don't care if I live or die. I don't care because they don't see England as a place of opportunity. They, they, you've got to understand, most of these kids are growing up who's got older brothers who are unemployed, mm. who they've got older, they've got dads who are missing in their life. So, for instance, when I went into Felton the other, not, not the other day, about six months ago, I held a couple of sessions. If, if, in every session, I had about, all together, I had about 100 kids all together, not in one day. And every kid, which was, I would say, 70% were black, the rest were like made up of mixed race and white kids. So about 30% mixed race and white kids. Every one of them, including the mixed race and the white kids had no fathers. Had, they didn't know where the dad was. At least 30 or 40 of them had said to me, they want to kill their dads because they grew up in a house where their mums were beaten up by their dads. So we're, we're talking about angry kids who do not feel a part of Britain. And I think sometimes there's this misconception that um, everyone is can, has an opportunity here. But if you grow up in a certain household, in a certain 
um, lifestyle where you see your dad or your stepdad beating up on your mum, or you see different men coming into your house, or um, you don't know who your dad is, or you, um, you, you, your mum speaks badly about your dad and all of that kind of stuff. Those are the things that brings a certain amount of trauma to young men's lives who then say, and if you listen to the guys in the prison, they talk, they've said to me, oh, I don't want to be like my dad, but they are. Mm. They have replicated exactly what their dads were because it actually says in the attachment theory that if you don't address the issues, if parents or guardians don't address the issues of their personal lifestyle, then it falls to your child. And your child would become what you was when you was a young person. Mm. So for me, there are many factors as to why we have senseless violence, but one of it is I don't care. Right. Thanks, Sheldon. I ask you to go on mute, Sheldon, whilst we um, yeah. go yeah. around the table here. Nana, let's bring you in and then I'll bring Anthony in on this. You know, if we just put aside <clears> London <throat> and, and what is said about, you know, black gangs in London, we could talk about that. But I'm I'm really interested in this senseless violence across the country. What is fueling it? Do you agree with <coughs> that? some of the... the yeah. I mean, I agree with some of the things that Sean said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back and address the this uh, so-called black thing. Uh, you know, he said that people are afraid to talk about it. I don't think they're afraid to talk about it, but I'll, I'll address that after. Let's mm -hmm. address the issue, the question at hand. The thing is, there's a multiple, there's a multitude of reasons why we've come to the point where we are. It's not just one thing, you know, and that's why people find it hard to, to solve. If you go to a doctor and you say you got a headache, he's going to prescribe you uh, a pill or something to address a headache. But if you have multiple ailments, it's not, they're not going to give you like a magic pill that's going to solve everything all at once. So for me, you know, it's a multitude of things. But for me, the key thing is, for me, is uh, knife crime is a, or, or serious youth violence. It's a mindset challenge. And I think Sean has alluded to that in terms of going to the prisons and speaking to these young people. It's a mindset challenge. You know, as you know, as a man, uh, um, as a man, uh, uh, the saying goes, as a man, as, you, you are what you think. In other yeah. words, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was yeah. gonna get, give her a little biblical quote there, but let's just cut that out. You are what you think. So yeah. if if the thinking is off from the start, it will produce negative results. That permeates every element of your of your life in terms of everything you do. Uh, you know, your attitude towards education, towards women, towards other men that look like you, or other men that don't look like you. The whole thing, you know, that's at the crux of it, yeah. and. If you start off with a position where, like I said, the, the, the thinking is off, it will produce, it will produce um, negative results. That's why I think it's so important for our young people um, to be engaged at early age, not when they've left primary school to go to secondary school, but actually in primary school at early stages. Because statistically, our young people do very well, I'm talking about young black kids, mm -hmm. do very well in primary school. They're neck and neck with other ethnic groups. But something seems to happen when they make the transition from primary school to secondary school, where some of them, you know, in terms of performance, it goes downhill, you know, and other things come into that. And yeah. people are always wondering, what is that? What, what what causes that kind of switch? And I think it's the age where they become aware more of their environment, you know, the influences in terms of they look around them, they see who are the successful, successful people, you know, uh, in their area. They might have a cousin or brother or sister that's gone to university, but as Sheldon alluded to earlier, they're going to university, they can't find work. They're struggling. Or they've got a qualification and they're working in Sainsbury's. So for them, it, it's not appealing. Mm -hmm. And they see all the people that are doing negative things within their area that are seemingly successful on the surface. Mm -hmm. Might have a nice car, might have all the women, wear nice clothes, etc. So naturally, you know, this is a natural thing. You're going to gravitate towards that because mm. that's what you see. That's what you perceive as success. Those like yourself, uh, Stephen, that are, you know, become, you know, barristers and lawyers and doctors and so forth. What tends to happen is that once they've made it, as it were, mm. they're out. And they're not visible or as visible to these young people as, you know, the shutters or whoever, you, you know, the, the people that are doing 
up to no good. They're not as visible. You know, I, I, I've been in Parliament where my friend will hold these, uh, you know, these sessions whereby all these highly successful black people from all, all walks of life are there. And I've, I've, said, I've said in Parliament, you know, you know, it's all well and good you come in here and, you know, stay tonight while you've done. That's good for you. But if I lined up 100 of my beneficiaries, would they know who you are? And that's, therein lies the problem. Visible role models. We need more visible role models from all walks of life. Because at the moment, they're only getting in terms of that vision of success from negativity, whether it's the music, whether it's this or that, or a very narrow perspective of sports mm. and entertainment. But we know that there's successful people from all walks of life that are in our community. So it's cut long story short, there's a multiple reasons yeah. um, in terms of how people get into that lifestyle. You can, you can line up 10 people and it all tell you 10 different stories of how they ended up where they are. Wow. Thanks. Anthony, um, let's hear what you've got to say on that. And also, if you could maybe help me address the issue of whether um, economics plays uh, a part in all of this. I mean, we're, we're going through perhaps uh, one of the most troubling and difficult times as a nation economically. And we know that poverty w will obviously play a part in this. But what are your thoughts on... Um, why this is happening well i'm going to pick up a few points that you uh, you raise at sheldon nice to see you again um and the the, the issue around um gangs and youth violence and actually uh, data clearly identified and this is data that we collected in the met police that actually uh, gang involvement was identified as cause of five percent cause of, of youth violence between 2011 and 16. so you know youth violence is not necessarily a gang problem Young, some gangs involved in youth violence, of course they are, but it's not predominantly a gang problem. That is that is government and media giving that impression. Now, we, then we started talking about it's got to be drill music, it's got to be drill music. Well, 15 years prior to drill music, rap music was the reason why young people were involved in violence. Uh, and before that, you know, Ozzy Osbourne biting heads off of animals was the reason why um, people were sat satanic. You know, music has always been a, a, a stick to beat uh, crime and violence with. Uh, and the other point, when we talk about social media and carrying knives, social media normalizes the carrying of knives, but it isn't the reason why knives are being, are being carried. It's, you know, they, they, they're carrying knives because young people truly believe they need to protect themselves. They believe they've got this, they've got this fear that if they don't, they, they've got this fear that nobody can protect them but themselves and the knife. And, and we've got to shift that, that the belief. And you said the key word that I want to talk about a bit later, Nana, mindset. It's about shifting that mindset because the mindset of these young people and people who commit violent acts, uh, and I, I've written a paper around about the five stages after a violent act. And, and I spoke to some young people about these five stages and they stood, stood, sat and looked at me open mouthed. And I could tell them about these five stages because I've spoken to young people who were dying in my arms. I could tell them about the state, these stages. I've spoken to young people who stabbed somebody and they've realized, oh my gosh, I've just killed somebody. And they go for these five stages of a violent act uh, and we need to explain that to young people. But talk about economics, um, Stephen. Yeah. Look, we cannot imagine what's coming around the corner. We've got we've got um, parents who already cannot feed their children. Yeah. We've got we know poverty plays a major part in in crime. Um, and thank you, Shoulder, you raise that. Poverty has a has a part to play in crime. We've got young people who, and parents who can't feed their children. So the first thing they'll do, people won't be stealing razor blades. They'll be stealing food. Uh, because they, they've got to eat. Um, we have children who are coming to school um, not being fed, not because they, the parents are neglecting them. The parents cannot feed them because they mm. cannot afford to juggle the lights or uh, the, 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 the cooker. So mm. you know, we need to be ready for this change that's coming. And it's not just, we're not talking about policing, we're not talking about the government, we're talking about everybody collectively. We need to be ready to support the families who are going to be struggling over the next few months as we as we embark on um, a, a winter of, discontent is an understatement, a winter of, we don't know yet, but we know that people are going to suffer. So the, to answer your question, Stephen, sorry if I've kind of gone off, off point here, but no to answer your question, Stephen, um, the economic situation in society is going to be a major factor and we need to shift our thinking uh, and i spoke to uh, previous before the show started we need to change the way we think of crime mm -hmm. and the well, reason i'm going to be asking you about that anthony th th this five stages that you've you've talked about um 
And, you know, I want to pack as much as we can in um, this evening. So I, 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 can I, I just I'm jump gonna... in quickly when he talks about the mindset? OK, yeah. um, I have um, five brothers and, and three sisters, two live in Jamaica and two were born in Jamaica and two were born in the most ghettoized area at that time, which was Spanish town in the most violent part of Jamaica at that mm. time. And when my brothers came over, um, they all came over in the 70s um, and all of us lived in the same house in poverty and, and, and that. And what I realised about the mindset, which is where I agree, totally agree. Mm. All of my brothers who were born in the ghetto of Jamaica never became gang members. I did. And I weren't born in Jamaica. I was mm. born here in England. And the mindset at that time was I was being abused by police officers and the National Front. So we decided to form a gang in 1976 to defend ourselves. So Anthony's right when he talks about the mindset. And when I was speaking about what I found in, in the prisons mm -hmm. and the answer of Brown when Nana says it's not one answer that can solid, because I know people are listening and they look, everybody wants an answer. But let me explain to you why I separate London from everywhere else. London is unique because of the populate of the young people involved. This is why I disagree with Anthony because we all go, we all throw stats. I did a statistical degree at university, so I know how stats can be manipulated by government, by local people, and each one of us who do a little stat, it's just to benefit our own selves and our own arguments. So it's no point me getting into a discussion around whether who's right and who's wrong. What I go by is the facts, and the facts is. I go by what the hospitals say, because it's the hospitals that deal with the stitches. It isn't me, it's the hospitals. And I know for a fact, just on hospitals alone, I'm not going by government, I'm not going by the mayor, I'm not going by gangs line, I'm going by what the hospitals have picked up. And the hospitals have clearly identified that in London, there is a contrast difference to everywhere else in the in in the UK, where a a, a section of uh, the black community, a very small percentage of the black community, are the ones ending up in hospital with either gunshot wounds or stab wounds, and those are the facts that we have to go by. Now I know the reason why many of us, and I know Nana and Anthony say, well, we're not afraid. That's because us not sitting here. Um, want to solve the problem, but we have to face the facts. I did a speech here in London, in Brixton, in 1987, around gun violence, when I my, nine of my friends were shot dead. And th the Rastafarian community picked me up physically and flung me out of Brixton Town Hall in front of my mum because they said, we don't have a problem in the black community. And so I'm not speaking from somebody who's read a book or is listening to this person or that. I'm speaking from somebody that's been entrenched in gangs myself, come out of gangs and is trying to help the black community to realise that if we don't address London, and I'm not talking about outside of London, because outside of London, we, uh, there's always a saying, um, um, look after the little and I will give you much, which is a biblical scripture, right? So I'm only dealing with London at this moment in time and we have to face the truth, whether we want to admit it or not. London has a specific problem with young black kids around violence. Now, All right. it, it, All it right, doesn't Sheldon. matter whether we want to call it gangs or not, mm -hmm. because when I speak to those guys in Feltham and they actually say it is gangs. So yeah. it, it all depends on who you speak to. So what I'm saying is if we're going to have an open discussion, mm. Um, and I know you said you don't want to just talk about London, which you're quite right to do. We can't be afraid to admit the failings of ourselves in our own community because we have <laughs> black men have failed the black community in London. And it isn't recent. We're talking for the last 50 years have failed in the All sense right. of the lack of parenting responsibility. And I'm not afraid to say that. So I just well, want to be Sheldon. clear. Yeah. Sheldon, look. You know, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't necessarily disagree with you, but it's just. It's just. You know. It's a lot. It's a lot more complex. I mean, you were talking about nineteen, whenever it was that you said you went to Brixton. You spoke to people in in, in Brixton. Nineteen ninety-seven. No? Yes. Okay. Cool. Uh, my generation, and I'm forty plus. The gun violence was 
was very um, within specific groups. Yes, right. Yeah, you knew who the who you knew who the government were. Yeah, and the, every area has their cliques That's and identifiable right. yeah. gunmen. Now in the current age, everybody's a gunman. Yeah, everybody's carrying a knife, and it's so and it's so indiscriminate and and so chaotic that we can't. It's not a very good comparison in terms of back in the day where you know in my generation the most you get is maybe you have a straight night with somebody mm. and, and physically beat them up. And then that's sort of transition into, into the hardcore gang, gang thing, but it was controlled within groups in different areas that had their own conflict. Yeah. Now, an A-level student who happens to wander to the wrong postcode can now get attacked. Yeah. Just for being a wrong postcode, but he's an A-level student. Yeah, I he's getting, he got time, food slipping, yeah. Exactly. I remember a time, right, where I could walk on Kilburn High Road. I've said this numerous times. I walk. I could walk on Kilburn High Road, identify who the bad guys are and who the guy, uh, the good guys are, based on literally what they're wearing. Yeah. Because if you're wearing a, a Versace suit or Avery jacket that costs four hundred quid as a 17, 18 year old boy, we know you're not working in McDonald's or uh, you know to earn that money to buy that jacket. We know for a fact. So we could even identify who the street guys were and who wasn't. And then there was even a protection of the so-called good youths. So people would actually go out of their way to say, look, this Tony here or Terry here is not on it. So let's leave him out of the equation and That's just funny. do all about ourselves. Mm. Do you understand? So the landscape has yeah. even changed around that. Of course. Where you could, you could have... You could have, uh, 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 for example, what happened in Wolverine a few years back. back. You could have a, a, a young Nigerian guy who lived in Wolverine, was educated privately, came back to Wolverine, and ended up getting shot. Sheldon, just go on mute for me. Yeah. So it's not, it's not as you know, it's not as quote unquote, you know, right, yeah. you know, uh, well, look, black and white as 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 it used to be. Yeah. Look, I mean. I've heard what Sheldon says, and we, we can talk about the nation and this mindless sense of violence which is sweeping the nation. And I get the argument about London. And you know what? Let's talk about London then. Let's deal with London. Because if we can deal with London, uh, and, and a lot of the crime that's committed in London is not just black kids, but let's just deal with London since that's where we are. I've got uh, comments here. Uh, Rachel says, I want to hear from the parents of the killers. That's uh, who I want to understand. What went wrong? What did they miss? Or, did, or do they live that lifestyle too? She says, at the end of the day, we have murderers in our community and our cemeteries are full of young people. Um, she wants to understand what has gone wrong. So, you know, Anthony, look, we, we can talk about Nationwide. But since we're in London and Sheldon's brought us to London and focused on London, let's be frank about what is happening in our backyard. Kids, um, kids riding around on, a, yeah. on mopeds in broad daylight trying to smash into a car in the West End. People's having their watches dragged off their wrists in broad daylight. There's a sense of lawlessness. What's going on? Well, let, let me, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that in about 30 seconds. I'm going to quickly just respond to something Sheldon says. Sheldon, you yeah. and I are about the same age. Yeah, I lived in Kingsman Estate in Hackney, one of the worst estates in East London. My dad stepped when I was 10. Um, four brothers and one sister, three brothers, one sister, and none of us went into knife crime. None of us went into gangs. None of us um, mm. broke the law. And it's, I'm not saying that you did something different to me. It's circumstances that you had that I had was different. So everybody doesn't come from that background. The, 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 the reasons behind the behaviours are complex. And to pick up what Rachel said, and Rachel was so, so right about what about the parents. The parents I've spoken to after their child has killed somebody, and as well as I've spoken to, I have spoken to parents, some parents say, it's not my son, it can't be my son. Some parents have no idea where their children are running at night time at school when they go to friends' house. Uh, parents, it's parenting, I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody. Parenting is different. It's different to how parenting was when we were growing up. And I know yourself, now that you're a different generation to myself and Sheldon. There's 20 years plus difference between us. But actually, the and parental me. engagement is that was was really, really important. And, and some of the strongest parents are mothers, not fathers. And, mm -hmm. and many a young person, and I've, I've got my degrees and I've got my qualifications and my mum was my rock. 
my dad was my my tissue you know because he wasn't there uh, but I'm, I'm, the point i want to make is let's not condemn those mothers that have raised their sons to mm. not be killers because there are That's more right. mothers that have raised their sons not to be killers than there are to answer rachel's question rachel um i have spoken to parents and they're not they're not from the same background some of these parents don't even realize their children are running road they haven't got an eye no idea whatsoever because they put a lot of trust in into their children and and we mustn't forget the children i've spoken to that have, that have, and i use the word children because they've been children that have taken a life are not murderers there was no intention to murder it's this this it's this it's this whole idea that the knife is their superpower it's not uh, and and every young person that i have come across that has committed a violent act a broken down in tears as a child would when they did something naughty. Not yeah, but, wrong, but naughty. sadly, Anthony, the reality is you say they, they're not murderers, but the law says they are and they're convicted yes. of murder. That's, it, it, that's it, it, the reality of it. And often I spend my time cleaning up the mess after the event and then trying to educate these kids about, look, this is what the law says and that's why you've just got a 25 or you get a 30 for shooting. Look, Sheldon... Um, Someone also says the village is broken down. Um, they talk about a lack of faith in the homes, in the community. If we're having a real conversation, let's have a real conversation. Has the village broken down? Is there anything really called a community? No, I totally, I totally agree. There isn't. There, I, I, and I'm glad somebody's actually raising that. We, we've got to start addressing that. We, we pretend as if we're all one. Let me tell you something, yeah? I grew up when we were all one. Let me tell you how that was, mm. when we were fighting racism. Back in the 70s and we burnt Brixton down and we burnt Tottenham down and we burnt Totsnip down. That's when we were one. Now we're fragmented. We're fragmented to the point where, as Nana said, we can't even agree that we have a problem in our community. We can't even agree on that. We, 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 we tend to try and defend our position. Let me tell you something. I don't mind sitting in front of the government and talking about structural racism but i also don't want to do that knowing full well that my community is so messed up that we can't even sit amongst ourselves to try and fix a problem that has been going on inherently for 50 years and my thing is is quite simple is that um the village has broken down. I hear lots of us keep telling everybody about, oh, it takes a village. There is no village. We're lying to ourselves, okay? Let me tell you something. I grew up when West Indians didn't even get on with Africans, okay? Mm -hmm. Because we were um, manipulated in school into believing that Africans were less than us because um, of, of slavery and all of that stuff. And because many of us grew up in a in a house where most Caribbean parents didn't understand about slavery because they weren't educated, we fell into that trap. And it wasn't until when the 80s come when we started to realise that we were lied to and that Africans and Caribbeans are one that it began to change slowly. So what I'm saying is quite simple. Our village was broken a long time ago, not mm -hmm. just recently, a long time ago. And yeah. what we have to start doing is recognizing that our village is broken. Let's come together and fix it and stop being afraid. And, and like Anthony said, we need to stop trying to apologize. We're not suggesting that every mother who raises a child on her own, her child's gonna be a criminal. We're not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a minority or small percentage of of, of, of our community that um, live in this parallel world of I don't care if I live or die. We're not talking about a vast majority of young black kids that are doing well and are yeah. trying to strive. And so sometimes we get caught up with, oh, it's not everyone. We're not suggesting it's everyone. I'm saying this quite clearly. I go into more prisons than most people. I engage more gang members than most people. So when people start talking about, oh, it isn't, it isn't um, everyone, I already know that. I'm not suggesting. What I am saying is that we've got to face the reality. There is no village. There is no community. We're not one as we should be. We don't all get along and we have to face the facts. 31% of black households in London are raised by single black mothers. End of story. We don't need to make that up. We don't need to be frightened. What we need to do is ask ourselves the question, why are black men so easily want to leave when the when a woman gets pregnant 
Why do that? Why do these men want to leave? Why? And I'll tell you why. Because most of these men never wanted to have children in the first place, ended up having sex, the woman gets pregnant and they're gone. And we've got to start asking ourselves a serious question about how do we educate young black boys around mm. relationships with the opposite sex? That's what we should be talking about. That's what will change things. Because at the moment, our mm. black women are raising black boys on their own. And it doesn't matter whether the woman's doing a good job or a bad job. She should not be raising a child on her own, regardless of whether she's doing a good job or not. And we, it seems to me that we're so afraid to talk about those whatless black men who have let us down and all we want to do is keep apologising, saying, oh, we're not, we don't want to offend them. Go to hell with what we're offending because our young black boys are in prison. Our young Listen. black boys are in mental institutions, so go to hell with trying to please those black men who don't want to raise their kids. So, Sheldon. Person, okay, I'm going off in one. No, Sheldon, let's Sheldon. I'm look, going look, off in one. No, you're not going off on one. This is a show, this today, particularly on Life in Focus, it's a weekly community production, and we seek to inform, change, and inspire. And particularly today, we want to have real talk about. Well, it was supposed to be about youth violence across the country. But if we're going to break it down, let's break it down to London, our backyard. And when we talk about the village being non-existent, look, you're not alone, Sheldon. You're not alone, Nana or Anthony. Chris says there is no village. It's broken down. Community's not here anymore. We even have a dame listening. And she says the same thing. She says the, there is there is no village. It's gone. So if we're going to have a conversation, let's have a real talk conversation. So I don't, no, mind. Do, do, I don't do, mind. Do you know what? Let me just come in quickly. And I think, you know, we need to be, we need to be aware sometimes of our surroundings and environment we're in. You see, one of the reasons why, you know, some of my uh, comrades, or what you want to call it, some of my um, people in this space, sometimes we have to be careful how we talk about the subject because the, one of the key reasons I strongly believe that the government is not investing in the change is because we perpetuate this myth about um you know the the, the um knife crime being a black problem mm. right and i'm not sure they want to focus on london but that's why i never focus on london because until non-black people realize that they're at risk as well yeah mm. no change will happen mm. because the whole reason why the whole world was screaming black lives matter because evidently black lives do not matter in terms of globally, in terms of the world. It doesn't. And that's the reason why we're screaming out black lives matter. You know, it, it is where it is. So the more we kind of have these open discussions, if you if we're having these discussions within our communities, we can talk about the lack of um, uh, uh, father figures. We can talk about this. We can't talk about that. As a community within our own space where we can be open and frank, but sometimes the, the, what happens is, is that, and it happens all the time when I see um, our people on TV, especially the mainstream uh, platforms, we go there and, see, and we'll say things like, you know, our black kids are dying, we're emotive. They don't care because all you're doing is you're reinforcing the, the stereotype they have already. This is the perception they have. So actually fueling that, it's not going to do anything because that's where they, where they think. I've been on BBC when I've told them this. I went on the BBC... Uh, 2019, I was reminding them that the first three victims of that year were all white. Okay? Mm -hmm. Including the, the young girl that was stabbed in the back of her neck, I believe, in a park, I think, somewhere in East London yeah, or yeah, I Essex or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. I reminded them that because that's the only way that you're going to get the buy-in from people that hold the power, hold the, 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 the kind of the fuel to put into the tank that's going to make the change. Not, you know, in terms of the problems within the community, that's something that's talked about all the time. We talk about this in WhatsApp groups every single day, 365 days a year. I spent the yesterday practically the whole day talking about what happened in Carnival. So these are conversations that, you know, we're not afraid to talk about. We're not trying to hide it, but we have to be careful how we execute. I hear, I hear that, Nana, but the, the reality is... Uh, when we talk about youth violence, particularly across the nation, we 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 know that it, it's there, um, and I'm I'm trying to find. I, I think there's a societal problem myself. Mm -hmm. I think there's a problem with society because if we want to take colour out of the equation, what is happening across 
the length and breadth of our country where young people feel that they can carry knives, guns, regardless of colour, take another life. Okay. What is happening to society? Let me let me jump in, Stephen, uh, please. Uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 yeah. I want to get this point across. Look, the fam the, the, there is no there is no family, no village, right? But who can, who's going to create that? We are. We are. We have to create that. We can't expect government to create that for us. We can't expect we we are breaking our own communities. We need to fix that. So that's the first that's thing. Right. We need to step up and say we want our community. You ain't gonna, no one's going to bring it for you. You know, it's as simple as that. You say, why are young people carrying knives? The young people I've spoken to, just like yourself, Sheldon, I've spoken to young people because I'm an educationist. I, I work in schools. I talk to young people in, in policing. And I've spoken to young people, both victims and perpetrators. And all of these young people who are perpetrators of violence have very little understanding of the human body, believe it or not. They don't even know where their organs are. They haven't got no idea that they've got veins and arteries running through their whole body. Yeah. And, and it took it took me, I've been doing this for 22 years, Sheldon. Yeah. When, when I received the Pride of Britain Award for stopping a stabbing, a boy dying, it was my mission to prevent children killing each other through knife crime. So I, I, just to talk about a very quick programme, we'll talk about the five fear stages. And yeah. when I spoke to some boxers, some young boxers in Lewisham uh, a couple of weeks ago, we spoke about um, what happens when you make a choice. We go back to mindset again. When you make a choice to use a knife, the choice to carry a knife is one choice that you've made wrong already. But the fact you're going to take a knife out and use that knife is a choice that you've made. You've decided to make that choice. So um, the point I'm trying to get to is this. We've got young people who are carrying um, weapons in their trousers. As big as they can fit them in, they'll fit them in. Um, when they get these weapons, they think this weapon is a, a super a super, a super, skin. I had a conversation with a senior doctor, a senior doctor who's doing some work around knife crime, and this senior doctor said, we need to arm our children with body-worn um, protective vests. Now, if you want to give more damage, just give them a vest. Give them a knife, give them a vest, and they're definitely invincible then. And they'll walk around thinking they could just stand in front of people with knives and, and start fighting knives. So we've got to make sure we dispel that. And that wasn't coming from a parent who's lost a child, by the way. That was coming from somebody that thinks they're doing a good thing around trying to address this issue about new violence. We need to be careful that we mm -hmm. don't hand the young people an excuse to carry knives even more so. When yeah. we talk about the five stages of, of a violent act, the first stage, I said to young people, I spoke to a young man who killed somebody, but he didn't know that. So when he stabbed somebody, he ran. When he got caught, I said, what do you feel when you first ran? He felt fear. And the fear was a fear that I've done something. I've done something. The fear, oh my gosh, what have I done? Because the adrenaline, what happens first? The adrenaline is up there. When the young person's got a knife, the adrenaline's so high, they don't see anything else but red mist. And then they, they fight, they get into conflict, and they use a knife. They start running, and the fear is, where am I running to? But where do I go? And that's the first stage. And that's what they go through. The second stage is the, the piece around um, doubt. They doubt. Hang on. But did he die? Have I killed him? I don't know. So in this, this is all happening in real time. They're running and they're doubting. They're saying, did I do it? Did I kill him? Did I do it? The next stage is the whole bit around um, confusion. The confusion. Where do I go? Because there's no such thing about on the run. People talk about, I'm going on a run. I'm on the run, man. You got, there's no such thing as on the run. You get captured. It's one way or the other. You get Because it's the person that's closer to you that tell the police where you are. It's, it's the people in your in your, your clique that will let them know where you are. Because you know why? Because they don't want to be part of joint enterprise. They don't want to be named as somebody else involved in that. So they're the first one to give you up. And the next stage is the regret. That's four stages down comes the regret. They start thinking, I wish I did something different. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? I, I could have walked away. I could, that starts going through their mind. And the last stage, Sheldon, what do you think the last stage is? Go on. The, 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 for me, the last stage is what I see in prison. They, no, the they last stage is fear, again, because they're waiting for something to come and take them to prison. So that whole fear, because they know the consequence. These people that use a knife, they clear the consequence. At the time the red mist is up there, the consequences have disappeared. But when yeah. they, once they've gone through that, that fourth stage, they realise, oh, my gosh, I've killed somebody, and 25 to 30 years is going to be taken away from them. And that's the biggest fear, because they sit in their bedroom or in someone's cellar waiting for someone to knock on that door and say, you're nicked. Sheldon, I, 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 I know that's true. Sheldon, I know can that's I ask true. you? Um, yeah. 
But just on the back of that, there are people who are saying, you know what, the sentences aren't long enough for stabbing and shooting people. But you've just heard Anthony say, you look, you get a mandatory sentence for a life sentence, then you get a 25 minimum tariff if you stab someone or 30 years with a gun. I mean, how much more serious does it get? Do we do we live, do we move to a position where we we have a full life term for anyone who commits murder? No, I'm going to be honest with you. The Go way on. our prison system is set up at the moment, it's it's been failing long before young black boys were going in prison. It was failing white kids. So, the prison system isn't a very good system. It's not a system of rehabilitation. It's mm. a system of just holding and releasing. Hence, why many kids or young people or adults, when they go into prison, get released, they commit a crime and come back within six months or come back in within a year so the prisons giving somebody a longer sentence does not ensure anything what we need to do is change the people who work in the prisons who mm. can understand the culture of violence the culture and the mindset of these young people through the social media so mm. i don't agree with longer sentences i think what we need is is better um, prison officers and therapeutic counsellors and psychologists who can relate better to the young people. So that's one of the problems. And I'm happy to say that's why the MOJ has given me a contract to go into these prisons because they understand that even though I'm nearly 60 years old, many of the inmates, even though they're 14, 15, 16, 17 and young and literally a third of my age, they can relate to me or I can relate to their lifestyle because of where I've come from. Mm. So it's what we need is better prison officers and therapists and psychologists who can relate to these young people's culture better. And that's what, you, what, you what, what do you say to people who say that's all woke nonsense? You, you know, it's all liberal namby-pamby nonsense. Well, uh, the reason why I say that is because at this moment in time, <coughs> are failing. So it doesn't matter whether I, whether my one my my thing works or not. My thing has never been tried, but their one has been tried and failed. So we've got a Absolutely. system where we've got a system where we've got young men who go into prisons. These same young men we're talking about who come out and then they go back in within a year. So the mm. question is, it's not about the question isn't about whether Sheldon has the right approach because yeah. I'm not sitting here to say that I've got all the answers. I'm mm. sitting here to say let's try something different Absolutely. because what Absolutely. you have doesn't work. Okay, Absolutely. Nana, can I bring you in there because I wanted to ask this yeah. question. Mm -hmm. So why are the current initiatives seemingly not working then? I mean, Sheldon's just alluded to doing something different. Why are mm. the existing things not working? And then I want to ask Anthony about funding who's who's currently being funded how are they funded um again is there an issue with the wrong people being funded nana um yes um a couple of questions there first of all i'm just going to quickly touch on something i said earlier about um i've lost it now it's got so many things are going on in my head I know, I've lost I know. It. Right, let's let's go back again okay so yeah. talking about um why you know why are the see... not working okay that's a very good question Look, my answer to this, and I've thought about this for a very long time, think about it, if people like us didn't exist right, in the community, it'd be a lot worse, wouldn't it? So I look at it from a, a different perspective. People say it's failing because, yes, people are still getting stabbed, people are still getting shot, and people are dying. So inevitably, that seems like failure to a lot of people. But if these grassroots organisations, a lot of them are small, um, you know, working with small numbers, if they didn't exist... Figure how much worse it would be. Figure how much worse it would be. That's where I, that's where I look at the problem now. It's not like it, it is a total failure. Mm. Think about how much worse it would be if people like us and other organisation all across the country uh, that are working, you know, on on, on shoestring, but you know, budgets didn't exist to try and um, change what's going on out there. Uh, but that's where I look at it. But you, you've got to understand, when you talk like that, Nana, you're making it sound like they're giving the contracts to small organizations. They're not. They're giving it to these big organizations who can't do the work. And the small organizations like yourself and others yeah. are, are not getting these big contracts. And what's happening is that we're on a shoestring budget and the yeah. big organizations who are not on a shoestring budget are in the prisons and cannot deliver the work. So mm. it doesn't matter whether yeah. I'm wrong or the, the facts speak for itself. They get the money Absolutely. and they are failing 
all the kids. It doesn't even matter about the colour of the skin. They're failing yeah. all the kids. So the yeah, question absolutely. is, is that what I'm proposing is to change the system that allows yeah. smaller organisations to have a bigger say of the pie so that we 100%. can affect change in the prison systems and stop the, the kind of um, cycle, stop the cycle being a cycle and break the cycle. Yeah, I want Anthony. Absolutely. Anthony, Absolutely. I need, I need, I need to jump in. Anthony, yeah. you come in. Yeah, I need to jump in very, very quickly. And I think we mustn't mustn't forget the, the victims that are left behind of these people serving twenty five to thirty because they've taken somebody's life, and there's a parent out there that has lost a child. So the prison system is there for a reason, and it's there to to address um, the punishment that should be in, put on somebody who committed an offence. So let's not forget that. The other piece that we need to get our head around, we need to start collaborating and not comp compete with each other. Because you, you raise some small grassroots organisations. I, I, I'm a Yorkshireman, I'm from Bradford. In Bradford, the, the Asian community is strong economically, educationally, yeah. and they support each other. What do we do? We see one of ours driving a, a, a brand new Range Rover. We assume they're doing something wrong until we know to drive it rather than doing something well. We need to work together as a community and start to work and collaborate. We've got organisations doing some great work by themselves. We have other organisations that work by themselves. We need to come together and say, these initiatives are working. Let's get them out there and let's do it together. We don't open doors, black people. We shut them. We need to open doors for people that, that have got the ideas and have got the, have got the energy and the drive to be part of the change. And to talk about funding, funding is very difficult and it's how you write your bids to get your money. And, mm. and sometimes some of the great initiatives are not, they're not bid writers. And you've got to employ a bid writer to write your bid, to get the money to deliver these packages. You can see behind me, I've got these bleed control education kits. I am rolling these out. I'm giving these away. I'm giving them, I talk publicly and I don't take money, I take kits. I buy kids. Yeah. I go to schools and I teach young people yeah. what happens when somebody bleeds and how long it takes them to stay alive while they're bleeding. I teach them how to stop a bleed. Have I funded? Has it been funded? Of course, it's not been funded. Why has it not been funded? It's too raw. It's too real. And it's well, this is the, this. Is, but Anthony, this is the problem right here. And I, I have a bee in my bonnet about this, where there's great work being done, like what you, you what you've just shown us here. Um, and Sheldon, the work he's done, Nana, the work he's been doing for so long. And I just happen to think that sometimes the government or the powers that be are not prepared to put their money where their mouth is to fund right. the people who are really doing the real work, who understand the community, who understand the issues. And I think there's a lot of grandstanding. And, I, you know, I wanted to get yeah. Sheldon's take on this. I mean, do you said sometimes there is some form of political game playing or apathy by the government or powers that be in tackling these issues until it starts getting really close to home. Of, of course, it goes with that. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I did, a lot of work. I, I, I did a lot of work with the Croxteff gang a long time ago, about 15, 16 years ago. If people don't know where Croxteff is, I'm talking about Liverpool. Before mm -hmm. Reese Jones was killed, before he was killed. And the minute Reese Jones was killed, a little white kid from a middle class area, not area, from a middle class background, coming on from football, all of a sudden, gangs is a big news and what i'm afraid of is that unless it gets close to home and don't get me wrong anybody listening to this i am not wanting any kid to be killed or stabbed i'm not wanting that but unfortunately the world we're in where black lives don't matter and poor white lives don't matter the only time it matters is when middle class white lives matter and so it's the point that Nana's made that it seems that the only time anyone wants to do anything about violence is when it gets close to home. That's the reason why I, I agree with Anthony when he says, as black people, we need to work together more. Um, we need to partner more. And I totally agree with what he's saying, that we fight amongst ourselves for crumbs on the table. But I think that's a divisive plan of the government to keep us fighting amongst ourselves so that we never ultimately fix the problem. Remember this, I grew up in a period where it's I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a term, but I, I, I just don't want no one to misunderstand it. The white man saves the day. Because ultimately, they don't want us to fix the problem. They want to be seen to be fixing the problem. So ultimately, by underfunding us, having us fight amongst ourselves, 
and having us in a position where we don't have bid writers, we can't afford to get bid writers, we can't capacity build, right, always keeps us in a position of not helping those in our community. So when you look at people, what Anthony's doing, that example, I didn't even know Anthony was doing that. And when you look at what he's doing and look at what Nana's doing, and other organisation, I've got a friend of mine by the name of um, Doreen, okay? My girl has had to empty her pockets to get something moving, mm. right? Empty her pockets to get something moving that will ultimately help them more than it will help us. And my, my thing is that that's the world we're in. That's why I agree with Anthony that we need to get back to what is community. We need to get back into how do we economically build ourselves? Because this is, and I agree, I like the point that you made about economics, because we do need to talk about economics. We do, we do need to start looking at how do we economically build? Because if we were economically in a better place, we mm. could help people like Doreen. We could help people like Nana and Anthony who are doing stuff. And we, he just comes to us and say, yo, this is what I'm doing. This is my plan. This is my strategy. And we could help. But he can't because there's not enough of us that is in a consortium to help him. So what we have to start looking at to fix the problem of violence and broken black communities and bro broken poor white communities is economically build ourselves up. And the economics is the way to break suppression. Economics is the way to break the, um, the glass ceiling. Economics is the way for us to start individually impacting our neighbourhood. So for instance, we should be sending 12 black students to Oxford student to Oxford University each year um, with their fees paid for like a scholarship so that they can then come back and do the same and we continue because what we have to start looking at is we have to start going beyond um, the violence, beyond the gangs, beyond the imprisonment and look now about economics. Because remember, if we continue down this process, we will never build ourselves economically. That's why I think it's important now that we start thinking economics. That's why I did an economic diploma. I didn't even know why I did it. I didn't even know why I did economics. I didn't even know why I did accountancy. But now I know it's because I was mentored by three people, Diane Abbott, Bernie Grant, and Jesse Jackson. What have those three people got in common? They were all big time politicians. And they all told me one thing. Mm. Don't allow racism to dictate your path. Don't allow gang violence to dictate your path. The only thing that you should look at is faith and economics and education to build your path. And it was through them that I understood the value of education and faith. So obviously, that's what I'm taking into schools now, to let understand that we've got to go past all of this and look at things from a faith perspective, an education perspective, and an economic perspective. 100%. And the point... Sheldon, and the can point, I say one thing, Sheldon, yeah, before you go? Me. One thing, one thing. We need to tell ourselves we are no longer an ethnic minority. We are a global majority. Yeah, I'm, doing a show, I'm actually doing a show on that where... We, that's the fantastic. use of words, ethnic minority, is yeah. something which Keeps feeds you small. into the psyche. Keeps you small. Yeah. We yeah. are global You're right. majority. You're right. People of colour are the large majority of people in, in the, the world. world. You're right. You're and, right. And if we, if, we start, if we don't start using positive mindset language, we're not going to change the mindset of young people. And, and it starts in education. That, the first person to teach me that was Jesse Jackson and in 1988. Go. And there one thing go. before you go, Sheldon... It's Dorian Sinclair and also Dame Claudine Jubilee are two women that are driving forward change out of their own pocket. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and you know, I have to say that it made me feel uh, qu quite upset recently um, with certain events that took place uh, with a charity or an organisation. The CIC was doing amazing work um, only to find out that that person was funding the operation, funding the work themselves. Yeah. And I'm asking myself, where is where is actually the commitment to actually see real change when people have a proven uh, project that yeah. works and they want to roll it out and they seem to meet? Look, I'm not interested in who can write a good bid. I'm, let, I'm me, in, let, let me let me let me let, let me come in, let me come in on this point quickly because this is something I've spoken about, you know. 
Go on, consistently. Nana. Good. I came from, um, before I started Access, I was working for a private firm who obviously delivered um, government contracts in welfare to work. So I had, a, I had an understanding of how the model works. Now, coming that experience of coming into the first sector, my whole perspective in terms of exactly what I was doing for, you know, that's focused on uh, improving outcomes for, you know, in education, employment, and enterprise for young black people, I knew that I was going to get a set load of money thrown at me to implement my plan to prove those outcomes. So I, I don't know if you know my, my story, but I actually, um, at the time I was heavily into buy to let properties, I actually, uh, you know, funded the whole operation for the first two years myself out of my own pocket. Mm -hmm. Okay, I sold one of my properties and I invested in it. But what we realized is that you, you ha we had to show a proof of product. So instead of going down a funding route, we went down a social enterprise route where it's show and prove. So you deliver this and we'll pay you this. So it's more of a contractual agreement than saying, you know, giving all the rhetoric just to get the funding. And most people fell. Ours was, you know what, we actually deliver and you, get pay and you, you pay us for it. It's simple in terms of what we do, because obviously we're about, you know, numbers. So we have got X amount of young black kids into education, X amount into training, X amount into work, X amount into business startup. It's very clean and it's very, you know, smooth in terms of showing the outcomes that you've, the impact you've made by having a bespoke, culturally competent service in career services. But too many of our people, through their lack of understanding, they chase the funding. Rather than saying, look, actually, let me go down the social entrepreneur route or entrepreneurship, which is more of a, a contractual uh, a, a exchange. You know, we deliver X, Y, Z, you pay us X, Y, Z. And if you structure, you know, the first major contract we had was with the, um, the DWP, okay? The first break breakthrough as an organization. That contract was specifically looking at uh, Black Youth Unemployment, being you know fifty percent of the time and it's still relatively the same now and it's, it's, it's steadily going up. It was looking at we're going to take a certain cohort of young black people from the job center, right, and put them into work. Initially, their thing was that well you know what Tottenham is a black area so we don't really understand what you're doing because obviously your customers are always going to be black. It's not about what color it is about what service they get that's different from the mainstream. How are you going to support a young black person into work by doing things that are different from the mainstream, what they're used to? Because what they're providing is a generic service, mm. a one size fits all, doesn't fit all. Mm. We knew from our background and our experience that we had to do something that's more tailored, culturally competent, and to get results. Lo and behold, we smashed our first contract and then we even exceeded our, our targets in the second one based on a, a cohort of black job seekers. So we, we had a proof of products to say, look, because of our, our, our approach, this is our success rate. So yeah. there's no there's no there's no there's no, there's no room to maneuver and, and, and talk any nonsense. The, the evidence is there. Give us the money based on your data, your stats, and we'll do the work mm. based on actually what we do, not what we're gonna say what we're gonna say what we're saying we're going to do. Yeah. And that Absolutely. works Anna. That works, Nana, when you've got tangible outcomes where you can count them. But with, with, um, the work I'm trying to do is, is stopping children carrying knives. You can't measure that as, as, as easily as you can measure how many people get into employment, how many people get into education, how many people go to university. Uh, but but, long but okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me answer that point. Let me answer that point. And again, this is about thinking how we approach things. Okay, so if the work you're doing is to stop, uh, is to stop young people carrying knives, what is the methods you're using to, to, to kind of bring that number down? You see my point? You're using tools that are, you get paid to deliver, to use the methods. It's a method that you're getting paid for, not, you know, I think sometimes we look at these things and we look at it from the wrong perspective. I'm just giving you my example where my lane is. My lane is the Chris, but, is the Chris. But Anna, what you've got to understand, what he's, what he's saying is qualitative data is never yeah. easy to record. You've got to understand the government, the, listen, the government are very mindful of that. That's the reason why government always go by quantitative data because they don't want qualitative. So let me give you an example. One of the reasons why they were able to shut the youth service down is because they couldn't qualify it. They couldn't, it was all about, 
youth workers going out and speaking to gang members. So when they couldn't count that, they couldn't, they couldn't, they didn't realize the impact these youth workers were having, who by the way were former gang members, right? Mm. They didn't, they couldn't, they said, oh well, they, they, you know, there's no we can't qualify. Whereas with your work, it's easily to quantify that. So you've got to understand how the government works. It's a manipulation. They know that p prevention is better than cure. But their words, and this is how I know this, because I, I, I used to sit um, before um, Tre Theresa May became prime minister, I used to have quarterly meetings with her and Ian Duncan Smith around gang violence. And one of the things I've noticed with them was always about not putting money into prevention because they couldn't count that. It was putting money into intervention because intervention you can count. So again, we have to understand the work that Anthony is doing is qualitative and it's just as important as quantitative, if not far more, because his is preventing or educating and stopping. Yours is um, coming in when you know you've got six people to find employment for and you can count that because if four gets employed, two don't get, you still meet some sort of quota. So again, we oh, have I'm to be wary yeah. about sampling yeah. how they sample. Because I studied this at, at university. The one thing I, 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 I agree I, I agree with you, but I think I think I think the inference we we do both. We do both. What I'm saying is that we need to learn to when we go into a room to tell these commissioners that we are the experts, they're not. Yes, so in terms of whether, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, you know, the, the contract, the, the contract we have with the DWP, this is a government agency, we wrote it. We wrote what the outcomes will be. We're gonna get X amount into work, we're gonna do everything was written in a way mm -hmm. to, you know, so we we provided them uh the, the kind of that information yeah. and they approved it. It's not a case of them telling us you're gonna do this, you're gonna do and you're gonna engage X amount of people. And this is, a, this is the problem. They, the power dynamic has to shift. If you're in a room and you tell, you t I'm telling the DWP, look, statistically, you're failing young black people. Yeah, all the data says that. We're coming in as experts within working with this particular community and we can deliver. Okay, cool. You can deliver. Go ahead and, and deliver against these, these um, you know, outputs or wherever it is. And we did that. What I'm saying is that we can we can we can set that agenda. We don't have to. It doesn't have to come from the commissioner to the the, the delivery partner. It, it can you can actually manage that I, yourself in I, terms I do, of I, negotiation. I, I, I do understand, but to get back to the point about how do we prevent the violence in our community? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the things that we we and I think we all agree is that the way to prevent violence is one. You have to accept that what is happening in our community, we are as much to blame as the government, which we don't. We totally try to blame the government in every scenario and we can't because those kids come out of a family home. They don't come out of a government home, they come out of a family home. And too many parents are finding excuses to say they don't know what their kid's up to. Let me tell you about some of the kids that I worked with and still work with to this day. They're out at one o'clock in the morning. Guess how old they are? They're know, 13, 12, 13, 13 14. years old. Now, I'm going to ask you, how do you blame Boris Johnson for your child being out at, at one o'clock in the morning and you're in your bed and your child is out there at 13? That You can't blame government for that. No. At what point do we take responsibility? Now, I don't know if we all got kids here, but I, I have kids. I've got um, a couple of Right. And there is absolutely no way can my boy, who is 16, could get up at one o'clock in the morning and tell me he's going out that front door, right? He can't tell me that. So the question then becomes is, why can't he tell me that? What makes my parenting skills any different? Mm. It's t it, it means most of us, a lot of us, need to take more interest in what our kids get up to. Stop trying to say you don't know. Start looking at what they're doing on social media. I have, I watch, my boy has got a thing on his phone and I follow where he's going. He, he's social media, my wife follows what he's doing on social media. Not because we're trying to bully him, because we want to keep him safe from, from people who might want to attract him. We as parents in this, in our community, I'm going to be pacific, Real talk, Black community, mm. we don't do enough. And mm. I'm getting tired of hearing these mothers saying, I didn't know. 
where you, you're in the 21st century, we're in social media, you've got to know. You must know what your kid gets up to. It's not acceptable a policeman knocks at your door and says, we've arrested your son. Did you know where your son was? Oh, no, I didn't know. I didn't know he was out. I didn't know he was at so-and-so's house. It's not acceptable. So yeah. we've got to stop making excuses for parents, right, and stop being scared of addressing this because if we want to fix gang violence or violence or um, drug dealing, county lines, call it what you like. If we want to fix it, it starts at home. It doesn't start with Boris Johnson or the police force. It starts at home. Let's get our character, the morals, the values of our children right. Then when they go out there and the policeman farces with them, then we can challenge the police because we know we've raised a child that isn't a troublemaker, that doesn't cause problems. Because I know if a policeman stops my kid and tries to frame him, say he's a drug dealer, and that, I know that ain't gonna happen because my boy has been raised in a way, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he's perfect, no one's perfect. I'm saying I know that if my boy gets stopped and searched, there is no way the policeman going to tell me he got stopped because he's in a gang or he's doing that. No way. He was stopped because you looked at him and said, there goes a black kid. He must be in a gang. That's what I would know. So my thing is we have to limit what our kids get up to so that when things go wrong, we can actually swear by our kids. But at the moment, we are not watching what our kids are doing. We're not focusing on social media. We're not actually doing the things as parents that we ought to. I'm, I'm not blaming everyone, but unfortunately, too much parents make excuses as to why they didn't know. We are all in the 21st century. And you, want to be real, you want to be real, and you know my background. I'm an educationist. I've been a head teacher in six different schools. And I've taken okay. schools out some very, very difficult places. And one thing I've learned in my 41 years of education, yeah, I know I look good for my age, Sheldon, um, is the fact that parents' evening, which parents came late? Black parents. Which didn't turn up? Black parents. So the question is, the whole thing around supporting your children, it's not just about what they do at home. We have to support our children in school. Our children can't turn up to school without their homework being done and said, I didn't get time to do it. We have to be making sure we sit with our children to make sure our children do our homework. I've got a son, I've got six sons, but one of my sons, my youngest boy, hates homework. He's still got to do it. He's, no excuse. He has to get it done. We have to be parents. And I, I, I'll take your point, Sheldon. I yeah. really take your point. We have to recognise that as parents, we are parenting our children. My oldest boy is 39 years old and he's still my child. At the end of yeah. the day, I would, I, I, I'm his father. And we, we we're parents until the end. We're not until the end. It's and really I'm going to be I'm going to be at the end because we've seriously overrun on this show today. But it's so <laughs> passionate. Um, that it's a really serious issue. I've not seen this many comments on the show for a long, long time. This is real talk. Look, I just want to ask all of you. Uh, and look, Doreen and Rachel, I hear what you say. And look, if you can muster up a group of young people to appear on this show next week for a part two. So I can hear the voices of the young people, yep. people who are maybe in that lifestyle. If you can find them for me and they're willing to come on, then I would gladly host them on Life in Focus because I've tried. But I always seem to get the adult voices. But I want to hear from the young people. I want to hear what they're thinking. I want to hear what their solutions are. Um, but look, guys, as we try and round this up, um, we're talking about how we fix this thing called youth violence. And we can talk about London specific or we can talk nationwide. What I want to know from each of you in a nutshell, your perspective of how we fix this. And I'm going to call it madness because it's a madness that's going on. How do we fix it? Sheldon. Um, I, I think it goes back to my point that I said that we have to be stronger parents, whether you're a single parent or whether you have both your partners there, we have to do parenting differently. And there are challenges, social media, we have to kind of adapt to a new approach and stuff like that. But we can't keep blaming the government or police for the ills of everything that happens in the community. We can't keep doing that because that's not gonna fix the problem. So I just think that we have to parent differently. 
we have to spend more time with our kids. And I don't mean when you're going shopping, food shopping, you bring your kids with you. I'm talking about spending more time doing what the kids want to do. There are things that my kids want to do that I may not want to do, which is go to the cinema or do things like they want to do. But it's important, especially black men. We don't do enough with our children. For instance, when I go to the barbershop, I see black women taking the boys to the barbershop. 50 years ago, it was a reverse model. It was black men that took their children. So the question is, is that we as men are not doing enough with our children. That's one of the problems. And two, we can't leave everything to the woman to do just because she can. That's another thing. And the other thing is stop pretending we're a village, stop pretending we're one, stop pretending we're a community and be honest and say we're not, but we can fix it and we can change this. Thank you, Sheldon. Nana? Yeah, as you know, um, I've done a video about four years ago on this particular subject. I broke it down into two segments, short term, because people want the fix now, now, now. Mm-hmm. And long term. So I'm just going to run through quickly some of the, you know, some of my thoughts. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, um, community patrols, you know, guardian angels, what you want to call it, um, you know, being visible in the community. And that's again coming back to the so called village or non existent village and, you know, looking after our own, um, you know, um, intelligence led, intelligence led stop and searching. Uh, in the community rather than the blanket stops that they do at the moment. Um, restoration of youth, you know, youth services, uh, promotion of um, rights of passage organisations in terms of kind of teaching our kids about self-love, you know, the heritage and all these things, being part of their, you know, upbringing. Um, <clears throat> increase in funding for grassroots organisations, which we've spoken about earlier. Uh, implementing a culturally competent uh, public health approach, mm. which is all about, it's all well and good replicating what happened in Scotland, but Scotland's a particular area with a particular demographic. How do you make it more culturally competent in London and elsewhere? Um, you know, I've talked about the social influences, the, the, you know, the musicians that are pumping out all the negativity. What, what responsibility do you have to kind of push positivity to these youths that look, look at these, people that they're gods. Um, you know, self-defense, I've, I've written it, self-defense classes, parental, you know, parenting classes, to teach them the skills, the, the warning signs to look out for. A lot of our parents are working, um, you know, they haven't got time to really dedicate the quality time that's needed to pick up certain behaviors. What can we teach them? You know, to, you know, what, what, what are the skills that we can, they can acquire? Visible role models, people that are quote unquote successful, making sure they're visible, making sure they come back into the community, making sure they give back. Um, that's that. But overall, in terms of long term, yeah. I've got, you know, things like the, you know, again, the the culture competent public health approach, independent schools, which I think is very, very critical. Um, what else here? Duh, 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 duh. Focus on entrepreneurship. A much bigger focus on entrepreneurship. A lot of the young people don't necessarily want to work for somebody else. They want to work for themselves. Mm-hmm. Are we equipping them with the skills and education for them to make that materialize? Yeah. Because Fine. you're talking to so-called gang members that are going to your job center and they're saying to them, look, you can you can you can be a laborer or work at McDonald's. That's not gonna exactly entice them to leave that lifestyle. Yeah. There's Absolutely. lots of things that they can do to make big money without being being locked up. They're not aware of it. Are they being exposed to these, you know, to these things? Mm. Uh, and I've also put lastly, you know, lastly, a culturally competent mental health service, which Sheldon kind of alluded to in terms of the therapy work, you know, that he does in, in, in the prison services, making sure it's tailored to get the, the best results with our young people. Thanks, Nana. Anthony. No problem. Yeah, um, mine, mine is, is strictly <laughs> education because I believe education has taken me from, um, but dark places into brighter places. And I think we need to focus there. And I think the first thing we, we need to do, we need to stop sharing trauma because we are doing it on social media, on WhatsApp groups. We're sending around content that is causing trauma in our own people. Yeah, it's ridiculous. We need to stop there first. The next piece is education. What about education? We need to train our young people that there's outcomes can be still, positive outcomes come, come from real good uh, mentoring, 
coaching and apprenticeships. You can get a degree and earn money. And, and we've got too many of our young black people who are not taking up apprenticeships. 4.7% of apprenticeships are taken up by black people. Degree apprenticeships, 86% by Asian people, 90% um, by Chinese and, and, and a few percent by white boys. So we need to promote other routes of education and, and not just academic. We need to be based looking at skills, skill set. Young people, we've got some skilled young individuals and we can't channel them into academic learning because we won't keep them in school. We need to address the anti-racist education agenda. It has to happen now because it's the, it, this is the problem across all schools, not just with children. We're talking about with school teachers, leaders, governors, everybody that feeds into education. We need to change that the mindset around anti-racism in schools. And the last piece of me, and I'm going to promote my piece, I want education to teach children how to control bleed not the bleed bit the education the science of the human body if they understood the human body and you, we talk about spending money i've designed a bleed dummy that bleeds a torso that i can turn off and on and they've got to stop the flow of blood i've got six um, six foot um bodies of pictures of the human body with every single artery and vein that runs through from their fingertips to their brain just so they can see visually this is what's inside you yeah. and where the organs are back and front because they don't know this hindsight is a really powerful so if you give them the information beforehand they'll make a different choice change mindset by changing mindset you need to give children information that they need to know what happens when you behave in a particular way but also we need to show love we need to tell our kids especially the boys that we love them and show them love because one of the things i've learned when i was growing up i didn't feel loved at home and if we if our children don't feel loved i know we're talking about education i know we're talking about all kinds of things but i'm going to tell you the truth without love nothing works because if you don't feel loved and you don't feel a part of something, you're not going to feel any, you're not going to feel anything towards education or anything towards fulfillment. We have to show our children love. We have to make them feel loved and we need to ask them, do you feel loved by me? Don't be afraid to mm -hmm. ask. I ask my boy that all the time because I know I'm not a perfect guy. I know that I make mistakes mm -hmm. and I'm telling you this, that's what's lacking in our community. And I'm not saying it's not lacking in white community, because it is, but because I'm being Pacific here, it's lacking. Why? Because we've moved away from God. And once you've moved away from God, all hell breaks loose. Now, I know some people will disagree with me because they're not Christians or whatever. That's fine. But I'm telling you, take the Christian out of it. You've still got to show your kids love. And what's missing, when you speak to those guys in prison, they don't feel loved. They don't feel wanted. They don't yeah. feel a part of their own family. And guess what they tell me? The mm. gang members make them feel wanted. No. Yeah. Sheldon, you're absolutely 100% right. Um, just on what you said there, I remember the case you talked about, Clapham. I was involved in that murder case. Mm. And I remember the kid who I represented who was found not guilty of murder. I walked down to the cells at the Old Bailey and I hugged this boy and said, listen, you've just been given your life back. And he held on to me like no other kid, even my own children don't hold on to me like that. With tears running down his eyes, he said, you're the first man who's ever validated me, sir. You're the first person who's actually male role model who's made me feel loved. I know I got in this situation, but I didn't kill anybody. And that's why he was found not guilty. So you're 100% right. We need to let our kids know that they're loved. Look, I want to thank you guys. We have overrun by half an hour on this show today, but this topic's too important to ignore. It's too important because I sense if we don't start having these real conversations now amongst ourselves and for the wider community across the country, we are in for some rough times with our young people and what's happening on the streets. We need to do a lot more collectively, individually. The village is broken, or it might not even have existed. We need to come to terms with that. And we need to say, we need to do things differently. We need to invest our time, not just money, but our time in our young people. As tough as it is, we need to invest our time to let them know that they're loved, to let them know that we're ready to focus on them. It's that time, it's now because things are going to start getting very quickly out of control as the economic situation bites. 
So we talk about parenting. We talk about education. We talk about a mindset. And we talk about economics. We need to understand as a community these really important factors, these features, which are going to change the destiny of our young people. Because I'm all about the young people. Enough is enough. And whether it's black or white, I'm not interested. But if we're talking about London and we're talking about our community, the black community, we need to start doing things differently. We can't always blame the government, as Sheldon says, for what our child is doing on the streets at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning as a teenager. We can't blame the police for trying to police the areas where other people live who want to live law-abiding lives without the risk of their children being stabbed. We have a number of problems that are facing this country right now economically. But we as a community, we as the citizens of this country have a responsibility to do our bit, first of all in the home and then in the wider community. I want to thank my guests, Sheldon Thomas, Anthony Peltier, Nana Agiman, Agiman. I want to thank all three gents for their honest contributions. I want to thank all of those who've watched the show tonight with the various conversations that have been in the chat and the questions that have been asked. We really have to really step our game up. And I mean that. We really have to step our game up. I want to thank all of you for your time. I want to thank you for watching. Uh, you've been watching Life in Focus. I'm your host, Stephen Akinsanya, Barrister at Law in London, Great James Street Chambers. Rachel, Doreen, if you get those young people, reach out to me. Let's get them on the show. Let's hear some young voices. Let's make it a part two. But please, wherever you are, make a difference. Make a difference because it's young people's lives that are being wasted, families being ruined, victims lost, unfulfilled destinies and potential. Enough is enough. Thank you for watching.